how you doing? We're recording this with Peter on Wednesday because on Sunday just things didn't go right technically. And we thought we'd try to get things uh, recorded. Maybe for some of you that would like to watch what would happen on Sunday and you couldn't watch because it wasn't recorded right. And well, we're doing this in order to be able to um, maybe set things up for Sunday. Maybe things will go right on Sunday for a change. But on Sunday, we talked about motives for right living. Why do you come to church? Why do you read your Bible and pray? Why do you do what is right and good? Often we know what we should do and the time is right for us to do it, but we don't do it because we lack motivation. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul wrote that all Christians should strive to have the mind of Christ. That is, we must think like Christ does. If a Christian thinks like Christ, he must serve like Christ did. He must joyfully serve sacrificially. In Philippians 2.1, Paul reminds us that we can have such a mind because God has given us comfort in Christ, the joy of his love, the fellowship of his spirit, his mercy and compassion. Paul then explains the mind of Christ. He explains how we should act when we think like him. Philippians 2 uh, verses 2 to 5. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain and conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking out to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, does this sound like our church? How unified are we? Do the people in our church put the things of others above themselves? Do we care about each other or only about ourselves? Now, if I ask these questions, when I ask these questions, you thought about only how people in the church behave towards you, then you have a big spiritual problem. This passage does not tell us how others should act toward us but how we should act toward others. If we read the commandments in the Bible and use them to judge others and not ourselves first, then we have a great spiritual problem. Jesus uh, emphasized this in Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 5. We need to repent. Sometimes people say, I can't live such a supernatural life. I can't sacrificially, sacrificially serve like Christ did. Here I must add that if you have not repented of your sin and asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you're right. You cannot live a life that is pleasing to God on your own. Only someone who's a child of God can live the way God wants us to live. God only gives the power to live a supernatural life to those who trust in him. But if we are Christians, we can live this supernatural life. The Apostle Paul and Peter agrees with this when he, when he wrote, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through the Scriptures, through the Holy Spirit, through the Church, God has given us everything we need to live a life that is pleasing to God. No. Our problem is not that we don't know or don't have the power of God to do God's will. Our problem often is that we don't want to follow God's will. In order to solve this problem, Paul wrote Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. In this passage, he gives us three reasons why should we should sacrificially serve God by serving others like Christ did. Why should we love each other? Why should we be unified? Why should we not only care about ourselves, but also about others? Why? Because we serve. We serve. Why do we serve? We serve because of the presence of God. We serve because the world needs us. And we serve because others are supporting us. 
Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to, uh, to fulfill his good purpose. The first reason for our sacrificial service is that we serve a loving and holy God who is always present. This passage, I don't like the word translation, dear friends, in verse 12. Other versions use, it, uh, use the word beloved. Uh, this word beloved not only emphasizes Paul's love, but God's love for the Philippians. It also reveals why we, sacri we serve sacrificially. We serve because we are loved. God shows his love for us, but his love for everybody. He shows his love for everybody, but his love for believers, he especially demonstrates. There was at least one woman who understood this. We read in Luke chapter 7 that she anointed the feet of Jesus with some very expensive perfume. Jesus said of her in Luke 4, 7, 47, Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Do we understand how much we've been forgiven? If we love God little, maybe we don't understand how great our sin is in his eyes and how much it cost him to provide the means so that we can be forgiven. What does he do? God accepted us just as we are. We were. God does not uh, uh, require that he will accept us only when we become clean. He gives us, he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us get rid of these sinful habits that we have. He moved us from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of Christ. He loves us. We are his beloved. God redeemed us from our slavery to sin. He has delivered us from the power of sin and our sinful nature. He has forgiven our sins. He has justified us before God. We stand innocent before, uh, and righteous before him. Because Christ paid the price for our sins. He reconciled us with God and restored the relationship that was ruined by sin. He loves us. We are his beloved. He changed the relationship now, uh, uh, relationships now, and God is our Father, and we are His children. God is our Christ is our Lord, and we are His servants. Christ is our teacher, and we are His disciples. He put us in Christ, and Christ in us. He put us in the church, the body of Christ, unifying us and giving us different gifts to serve Him and each other. He loves us. We are His beloved. Now, we say that we believe God created the heavens and the earth. We also say that out of love, God sent his son, Jesus, to die for our sins. These two statements are beyond comprehension. David declared in Psalm 8, 3 and 4, When I considered your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Mankind, are you mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. If God is so big and we are so little, why? You would think he would uh, not even notice us, much less love us. But the Bible declares that we are loved by a God who is present with us. Now, I've only listed the spiritual blessings that God gave us when we believed in him and repented. All of this should motivate us to sacrificially serve God. In addition to all these spiritual blessings, each day, God gives us many spiritual and material blessings. And when we praise and him, sacrificially service comes naturally when we count all our blessings. Now, where is God? Is he here? 
Is he on the street? Is he in our homes? Is he at work? He's everywhere, isn't he? Then why do we act differently in different places? And I'm not ignoring that different places, in different places, we have different responsibilities. But we often live with different moral standards in different places. At work, have you seen, or in your classroom, have you seen how oh, suddenly people begin working diligently when their boss or your professor is there? Parents often see their children suddenly begin to behave when they notice their presence. Why? Human presence often changes the actions of other people. Once I saw a friend who smoked. When he saw me, he hid the cigarette behind him and threw it away. Why? Didn't he like that cigarette? No. He probably thought I would condemn him. But God saw him even before I did. My, action, my friend's actions showed he was more concerned about my presence than the presence of a holy God. Sometimes when I lecture in the missionary school, uh, students become inattentive and, and they whisper to each other or, or pass notes and, and, or maybe play on their telephone. To help them listen carefully, sometimes I go and stand right next to that person while I talk. For some reason, they immediately cease to whisper. Do you think I should do this when I preach here? How would you make that feel if, if I would go and, and, and start preaching standing right next to you? I don't do that because I got, uh, uh, I'm recording things, but it would be interesting experiment sometime, wouldn't it? You see, the presence of another person often changes the actions of other people. How much more should the presence of God change our behavior? The Philippians should be much more obedient during the absence of Paul because God's presence was to be more important than the presence of Paul. The presence of our loving God gives us a multitude of reasons for working out our salvation. But what does the phrase, work out your salvation, mean? This does not mean that we have to be perfect in order to be saved. Paul here says that the Philippians already had salvation. They just had to work it out. In the following verse, Paul explains what it means to work out your salvation. He explains why we should do it. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. That's what it means to work out your salvation, is to will and to act according to his good purposes. Our salvation is the work of God. It's the gift of God. And what is God doing now? He works with us to work out our salvation. Verse 12 tells us what we should do. Obey God. Verse 13 explains what God does in this process. He works in us so that we have the desire to sacrificially serve. He works in us so that we will do God's will. He does this all not for our, our good pleasure, but for his own. Why do we go to church, sing, listen to the word of God, sacrifice? give offerings, take part in communion. We do all these things for his good pleasure or to please God. Why do we attend small groups for Bible study as well as prayer? Because we want to or because God wants us to. But why? what does God do so that we have the desire to act according to his purpose and work out our salvation? In verse 12, we read of God's loving presence, but also how this understanding of his presence can produce fear. If we understand how much God loves us, then we would want to act for the good pleasure of God. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. First John 4, 19. But what about fear? It says, work out your salvation with fear fear and trembling. God is holy and he hates and condemns sin. 
It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We need to understand the results of our sin. So God disciplines us. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as a discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline when you are not, then if you're not disciplined, then you are not illegitimate. You're not legitimate, not true sons or daughters at all. That's Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 8. Our loving Heavenly Father disciplines us. So we fear when we sin because we don't want to be disciplined. But John says there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. John, 1 John 4, 18. So how can we love God and fear him at the same time? How can we understand the relationship between love and fear? Maybe the, the story, the following story I found once can help. There was a boy, it was a boy named Wally, and his father was the rector of, the uni of a university in Canada. Now, uh, every spring and summer, the, the, the faculty children played soccer in the place where in winter the students play hockey. Now, in Ghana, I know that you don't do that because you don't have uh, frozen and uh, places in to play hockey in summer in winter. But in Canada, they did. And, and so in summer and spring, the children would run around barefoot in the grass. And therefore, they stumbled on the stones which were in the grass. And every spring, when the children played football on this, on this field, they found some rocks and they threw them over the fence. The rocks came up because the, thaw, throw, uh, the freezing and thawing of the, of, the, of the ground works rocks to the surface. Now, Wally had a bad habit. He threw these stones not just over the fence, but at a nearby street lamp. One day, his father saw him doing this and sternly said, Wally, what are you doing? Never throw stones at the street lamps. But Wally didn't think it was that bad because he had missed every time he tried. In addition, it was his tradition, uh, which he didn't want to stop. But once, Wally launched at the stone and broke a, seat, a street lamp of 6,000 watts. Now his friends said they wouldn't tell anyone about this, and especially his father, but at that point, Wally's life changed. He started living in fear. It was especially difficult when Wally's father strongly demonstrated his love for him. Wally felt worse and worse. Finally, Wally could do live, uh, no longer live with its guilt, this guilt and fear, and he went into the office of his father and told him what he had done. His father slowly got up and went to an aunt, Wally, and then he did something which Wally absolutely didn't expect. His father knit, knelt down hugged him and whispered, Oh, my Wally, my Wally. Now, Wally couldn't restrain his feelings and began to weep in repentance and love. At this point, Wally didn't feel fear, but love. You see, perfect love casts out fear. And when we repent, God forgives our sins. He's promised to do so. But this does not mean that our sinful habits or sinful nature have disappeared. So when we sin, God wants us to come before him with fear and trembling. And then he can pour out his love and forgiveness. Then his perfect love drives out our fear. Now in response to God's love, we love him. And can stop sinning. You see... Without sin, there's no fear of punishment. If you're doing what is right, you don't fear punishment. When we stop sinning, our perfect love casts out fear. You see, the perfect love of God and our own love drives out the fear of punishment. 
We are only afraid that we will not serve our loving God as he desires. In her autobiography, autobiography Corey Tenboom describes her and her sister Betsy's horrific time in a Nazi concentration camp in the early 1940s. On one occasion, they were forced to take off their clothes during an inspection. Corey stood in line, feeling defiled and forsaken. Suddenly, she remembered that Jesus had hung naked on the cross. Struck with wonder and worship, Corey whispered to her sister, Betsy, they took his clothes too. Betsy gasped and said, Oh, Corey, and I never thanked him. Never let the brutality of the world take away your thankful heart. Remember, you are God's child, and he has shown you his goodness and his mercy through his work on the cross. You are loved. Our loving and holy God is always with us. God is the main reason why we serve sacrificially. But both the story of Corey Ten Boom and Paul in writing to the Philippians here gives us other reasons why we should serve sacrificially. Philippians chapter 2 verses 14 through 16 say, do, nothing, do everything without grumbling or arguing, in other words, obey, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. We must serve sacrificially because we live in a sinful world which needs to hear and see the holiness of God's love. Sometimes when we do something because we have to do it, we don't have every and we don't have everything we think we need either we secretly grumble against each, against each other or openly express our doubts we may even stop doing what we should do i think that god sometimes allow inconveniences and troubles in our lives to reveal to us the real motives for our desires and actions you remember Job? God, uh, Satan said Job did it because God was good to him. God said no, he does it because of his uh, faith, faith in God, his love for God. Do we do everything for our own selfish reasons or out of love for God and others? You see, these inconveniences in our lives, their difficulties, show us that we live in a world that needs our help. If the world sees a lack of unity between Christians and complaining and arguing, sometimes the world rejects Christ. If the world see us, sees us as unloving, we cannot call ourselves the light of the world. Instead of arguing and complaining like the world usually does, we should be different. This does not mean we need to be perfect, perfect in order to witness about God. No, no. The, the world needs to see the process of God working out our salvation. The world needs to see how God changes us. Then they will say, if God can change that person, then he can change me too. We exist to glorify God. People glorify God when they see sinners become without fault, pure and blameless, sons of God, children of God, in a warped and crooked generation. We serve sacrificially because we, like God, love people in this world. And we want them also to become children of God. In this world, there are many people who have it much worse than we, than we do. Once I read about a girl that had been lured into sexual slavery at an age of 12 years old and then raped 43,200 times over the next four years. 
We live in a very dark and evil world that needs our sacrificial service. People need our help. Can we help people? The following illustrates the need and, and how we can make an effect on others. It was the 1st of September that a teacher named Mrs. Thompson told her fifth grade pupils something which later, later became a lie. She said that she would treat everyone equally, but that was impossible because right before her in the third, third row sat a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. She had already seen this boy last year and noticed that Teddy was not friendly with other children. He was always dressed sloppily and often dirty. Teddy was not a very appealing boy. Because he was so unpleasant, the first few months it gave her great pleasure to mark all his writing errors with a great big red marker. And she liked giving him ones and twos. Like everyone else, she made life difficult for Teddy. However, as part of her job, Mrs. Thompson read the characteristics of each of her students that were made over the past years by the other teachers. The characteristics of Teddy greatly surprised her. The first grade teacher wrote that Teddy was a smart and studious boy who often laughed. He did his work carefully. He had good manners and everyone loved him. The second grade teacher wrote that Teddy had been an excellent student and everyone liked him. But he was troubled because his mother was terminally ill, making his home life harder. The third grade teacher wrote that Teddy worked well, but the death of his mother was a great blow to him. He always tried to excel, but his father was never interested in his success in school. His home circumstances had negatively influenced Teddy. The fourth grade teacher wrote that Teddy was often absent and was not interested in anything happening at school. He had few friends and sometimes he even slept during class. He often was late and created problems. Mrs. Thompson realized what had happened with Teddy, but she was very busy with the preparations for the celebrations of Christmas. But the day before the holidays, she knew she had to do something about Teddy. That day, all the students brought her gifts. They were all beautifully wrapped, except for the gift of Teddy. His gift was a messily wrapped in brown, uh, brown paper. Thompson, Mrs. Thompson opened Teddy's gift last. Some of the children started to laugh when they saw a cheap bracelet of beads and a bottle with inexpensive perfume a quarter full. The laughter stopped, however, when she said the bracelet was very beautiful and she put it on her arm and, and dabbed some of the perfume on her. Teddy was the last to leave that day and told her, Mrs. Thompson, you smell today like my mom. Mrs. Thompson cried for a whole hour after that. From that day on, she began to pay more attention to her students, trying to understand how they lived. But to Teddy, to Teddy she paid a special attention. The more she worked with him, better he studied. During big exams, she especially wore the perfume that Teddy had given her. By the end of the school year, Teddy had become her favorite pupil, despite the fact that he had, she had promised that she would treat everyone equally. The following year, Mrs. Thompson received a note from Teddy in which she wrote that she was his favorite teacher. A few years later, he, she received another letter from him saying that he had graduated from high school with honors. She still remained his favorite teacher. Four years later, Teddy wrote saying that despite all the difficulties, she had, he had graduated from the university. Mrs. Thompson still remained his favorite teacher. Four years after that, he informed her that he had enrolled in graduate school and he signed his letter, Doctor of Medicine, 
Theodore Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson remained his favorite teacher. But that was not the end of the story. There was another letter. Theodore Stoddard, M.D., wrote Mrs. Thompson that he was soon to be married. He explained that his father had died a few years ago, and he wanted to know if Mrs. Thompson would agree to go to the wedding and sit on the side which usually was occupied by the parents of the groom. On this special day, she wore the same bracelet that Teddy once gave her. And I think she also wore the perfume that Teddy mother's, Teddy's mother had worn. It's interesting how God works when I prepare sermons and brings things into my life. And it's interesting that I had an illustration how, how we can have an impact on people. In our daily bread, I, which I read every morning, uh, I read of a woman named Joanne Flanders Thomas, who began visiting one of South Africa's most violent prisons for men. As a result of her ministry, the recorded acts of violence in that prison dropped from 276 to two within a year. The world needs our help. However, sometimes we're like a woman who said to her husband, you know, I think I need to find another job. Where I work, there's so many sick people and I'm afraid that I or you or our children might become infected. I have a good education. Maybe I can find a place where not, there are not so many sick people. But her husband replied, what you saying? You're a doctor. You need to be with sick people to help them. You know, over the years, some Christians have come to me and asked that I help them move to America or Canada or someplace else. They tell me about their difficult life here in Russia and complain that due to corruption, they can't live a life pleasing to God in Russia. Such requests really upset me. Yes, I see the problems here, but there are problems everywhere. I work hard to learn the language and the culture of Russia to spread the gospel further and so that Christians can work out their salvation. When Christians work out their salvation, they become effective witnesses for God. But if all Christians leave Russia, how will people in Russia know about God? God loves Russia. What about us? We are the light of the world. We are the light of Russia. We are the light of Volgograd. You are the light in the schools in which you are studying, your institutes, your university. We are the light at our work, our homes, in our families. You see, the first reason why we serve sacrificially is the presence of our loving and holy God. The second reason is this world needs our help. But there's another reason. We must serve sacrificially because many people have sacrificed so that we might become children of God. Other Christians are also the reason for our sacrificial service. In our lives, there are people who have helped us. Paul labored much and suffered much so that the Philippians could become children of God. They loved him for this. He gave them the words of life and wanted them to include this word in every moment of their lives. Then Paul could later give them as a fruit of his ministry to God. Philippians 2, 16 to 17 says, as you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. We know what it costs when we sacrifice. When people don't appreciate what we do for them, what we do for them, it hurts. When people see how much it costs us to help them and at the same time are ungrateful, we sometimes lose the desire to serve. The greatest blessing for every pastor is to see how people live lives pleasing to God. I think people in Russia understand the true meaning of sacrifice better than many people in America. Everywhere here I go, I see memorials of those who have sacrificed for their country. 
Some of them, on some of them, you can see flowers. Why? Why put flowers on memorials? Maybe it's just a tradition, a tradition or an acceptable, uh, acceptable political act. But I think that a lot of people in Russia are grateful to those people who sacrificed their lives for the sake of peace. They often seek to remind everyone how others have served sacrifice, sacrificially for them. And in doing so, they help us to serve others. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is compared to a fire. He burns in us so that we can speak and act according to the will of God. Through Bible study, through prayer, through doing God's will and through worshiping God together, we fan the fire. When we don't read and don't listen to God's word, when we don't pray, when we refuse to repent and do God's will, then we do not worship God together. And when we don't worship God together, we quench the fire. We quench the Holy Spirit. From time to time, we go back to America and meet and talk with people who are praying for us and assisting us materially. We're supposed to do that this summer, but uh, Lord willing, we, we had, to, because of the pandemic, we put it off and Lord willing, we'll be able to do it next summer. These people we meet sacrificially support us because the Holy Spirit prompts them and works in their heart. And we need to go back so they can learn better that we are doing God's will. In this world, And there are many needs, and each of us has a limited amount of time and money. And God wants us to sacrifice with wisdom. When we meet people and talk with them about what God is doing in Russia, the Holy Spirit can work better in their hearts. When we fan the fire of the Holy Spirit, others willingly sacrifice. Now, I do this now through letters, but speaking someone face to face is so much better. You can communicate so much better when you're in person than doing this over a camera or, uh, or writing the letters. These contacts also help fan the fire of the Holy Spirit in my own heart, especially when I'll see how people sacrifice. sacrifice. Poor people often give much more than the rich. The sacrificial service of others motivates us to sacrificially serve also. Now, no one wants to work in vain. But Paul was happy to serve sacrificially, even though sometimes he did not see the results of his ministry. Why? The first reason for his service was the presence of his loving God in his life. God had given him a great salvation and great opportunities to serve him. How could Paul not sacrifice? What about us? If God has given us the gift of salvation, if we are God's children, if we have the Holy Spirit, if we have spiritual gifts, then how can we not sacrificially serve? If we do not want to serve, then I believe we have one of two problems. Either we are unbelievers and we don't have the Holy Spirit. Or we have quenched the Holy Spirit. In these cases, we take a little time to serve our Lord. We need to serve sacrificially because Christ sacrificed himself for us and now works in our lives so that we can also serve. We need to serve sacrificially because we live in a needy world world that God loves and that we should also love. Through our service, people can see the love and holiness of God. We need to serve sacrificially because many believers have sacrificed something for us. How can we then not sacrificially serve? In some places of the world, it's very difficult to, for, uh, for people to be openly a Christian and serve. People or Christians are, are persecuted and even killed for their faith. We don't have any problems like that here. But we do have the capacity to serve sacrificially. Let us work out our salvation so that our Lord will tell us one day, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
May the Lord one day say these words to each one of us. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you give us opportunities to serve and serve sacrificially. I thank you that you remind us of your holy and loving presence, sometimes through disciplining us, sometimes through the grace that you pour out in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you show your love in many ways. And that you bring people into our lives to prompt us to serve. Lord, we live in a very wicked world. And we see problems all around us. Help us not to withdraw. But to boldly go forward and witness for your goodness, of your goodness and your love. Help us to shine like stars giving people direction and light. Thank you, Lord, also for the many people who have sacrificially given so that we can know you and serve you. I pray, Lord, that you will bless them and you will keep them. I pray that your, your hand will be upon them and help their sacrifice. Uh, work in our hearts so that we will be able to uh, also serve as you would like us to serve. Thank you for your time, for, for your word, and the challenges that we can get from it. And help us this week to serve sacrificially. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I hope that uh, you have either downloaded the sermon and, and have, have worked in your groups, but talk with somebody and and say why can we sacrificially serve our other for others for God you might uh, talk with one another about your motives why do you do what you do and uh, choose this week to decide to serve the Lord may the Lord bless you and keep you as you serve him I mean